Good afternoon and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for this first mission status briefing on the flight of Columbia on STS-107. With us today to discuss the first 24 hours of this scientific research flight are Phil Engeloff, the STS-107 mission operations representative, Dr. John Charles, the STS-107 mission scientist, and Tom Goodwin, the project scientist for the bioreactor demonstration system, the BDS. And we'll start off with Phil. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Obviously, for all of us involved in the flight, uh, the first thing to say is it's great to finally be in orbit. Um, I'm inclined to tell my teams that uh, space flight is a team sport, and there's a huge number of people involved in getting a mission off the ground and executing it, and uh, that's especially true of STS-107. We have uh, an extremely large cadre of people involved in the execution of this mission, and they're all happy to be here now finally doing what we've been uh, in training for for quite some time. But even uh, before that group of people, as most of you are aware, there's been a huge number of people uh, working extremely hard over the last couple of months to get the orbiter cleared for flight and to get this mission off the pad. And I'd like to start off with uh, just a congratulations to the team overall for what has been and just an incredible amount of work that's been put into the program uh, to get us to this point. Uh, congratulations to the payload community as well. They've been doing a great deal of work with the training and updating of the science to keep up with the launch date changes and getting ready to fly. And uh, we have a very, very well prepared team of people both within NASA and the payload community here for this mission. Um, as far as the mission so far, uh, we had a beautiful launch. Uh, the vehicle is performing exceptionally well. We're very, very clean with only one or two extremely minor uh, issues to work on at this point. The crew is doing well on the timeline. Most of the payload activations are complete. All of them that have been scheduled up to this point are completed with only uh, a few uh, remaining to be uh, performed as scheduled later in the mission. So we're doing really, really well. The crew's doing well on the timeline. They're, uh, they, they look great. They sound great. And everybody's extremely pleased with what we've accomplished in the first 24 hours of the flight. So uh, I guess with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Phil. I want to echo uh, Phil's comments about uh, the, the uh, stunning beginning of the mission. I was at the Cape the other, yesterday watching the launch, and that was one truly one uh, uh, to be remembered. It was a, a memorable launch. Uh, the payload activities so far are pro progressing well as far as the, uh, the NASA payloads that I'm responsible for, the Office of Biological and Physical Research. Uh, everything has progressed more or less normally up until now with the uh, occasional usual ex expected uh, uh, hiccups as we activate a brand new laboratory and, and some payloads that have been waiting a long time to get into orbit. In the area of the human life sciences, uh, the centrifuge is configured for future uh, metabolic analyses. We have the, uh, the, the uh, microbial physiology experiment powered up. The crew is on the first night started wearing their sleep watches, their actolite watches that measure their activity in the ambient light in the cabin uh, to allow us to understand more about how sleep is altered in space flight. Fundamental biology program, the, the uh, uh, FRESH experiment, the rodent experiment is progressing nominally with, with health checks occurring so far. The biological research in canisters, some smaller experiments has been activated and is performing nominally. Uh, in the area of microgravity sciences, uh, the space products uh, development experiments, the commercial protein crystal growth, uh, protein crystal crystallization furnace was activated on flight day one. It's going through its temperature profile now. Uh, the uh, other experiments, uh, the, the, uh, the CBIX uh, experiment, the commercial uh, uh, ITA biological experiments uh, activated anomaly. Other experiments in the space products development area are, are awaiting their, their nominate, their activation per the timeline. And in the microgravity area, per se, the, uh, bi the uh, bioreactor that uh, Dr. Goodwin's going to tell us about here in a second has been activated nominally. And the acceleration measurements by the, uh, the space acceleration monitoring system uh, activity was, uh, the, uh, was deactivated as scheduled after launch and is being activated uh, again as appropriate for the individual measurements that are, that are planned uh, for microgravity science. Looking ahead over the next shift or so, uh, the human life sciences experiments uh, and NASA start with a collection of frozen and ambient saliva collection, one of the less glamorous aspects of space flight and uh, one of the more important parts of, of any investigation such as this is collecting basic specimens in flight. 
We're going to be uh, doing more uh, astroculture activities scheduled today that is growing uh, plants for examination of genetic uh, expression in flight. And the zeolite crystal growth experiment was just activated as I was coming over here. Uh, and uh, also the, me the uh, mechanics of granular materials experiment was being activated today as well. So all in all, things are going uh, as, as, uh, as scheduled, and we're looking forward to, uh, can't believe, over two weeks of, of detailed and uh, uh, highly intensive data collection and a lot of experiments that have been waiting a long time for this chance to fly in space. That's all I have to say. I'd like to have uh, Dr. Tom Goodwin talk to you more about one of those experiments, in particular the bioreactor system. Thanks, John. Well, I can say to start off with, I think that uh, both uh, the, the PI team, uh, Dr. Leland Chung's group at Emory University, and uh, the payload support team are very excited about what we're seeing so far. Uh, in the first 20 hours of this experiment, we've uh, actually seen um, a significant uh, aggregation of uh, this tumor tissue that we're culturing. This experiment's purpose is to look at the uh, potential development of uh, three-dimensional high-fidelity tumors that can be formed from prostate carcinoma and the bone stroma, which is the primary site of metastasis or that site it, from which uh, or to which the uh, prostate carcinoma will migrate uh, in the human body. This is very important because um, understanding this particular phenomena gives us a window and potentially intervention methodologies for looking at how we might combat this disease. And so far the, the experiment is going extremely well. Um, the aggregation of a uh, approximately 1.5 to 2 centimeter piece of, piece of tissue in the uh, reactor um, is analogous to results that we've seen in other uh, experimental protocols that we've done in the past in the bioreactor, so we're encouraged by the synergy there, and uh, we're hopeful that this will continue throughout the experiment and that uh, at the end of the experiment we will be able to return uh, significantly larger uh, tumor aggregates than could have been accomplished on the ground to uh, Emory University for potential gene therapy activities. John? I think that's all we have for you, okay. Rob. Thanks. Uh to our panel. Uh, we'll take questions here in Houston before going down to the other centers, and we'll start off here with Mark Corot. Thanks. Uh, Mark Corot from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, for Tom Goodwin, could you ex explain um, how large this tumor tissue culture will get uh, if, you, if you run the full course? Then how will you preserve it on orbit somehow? Could you talk about that before you land, or how do you protect what you get from that experiment? Yes. Um, we're actually doing um, a multi-phased collection of samples. Um, we'll be collecting tissue specimens throughout the course of the experiment. Um, those samples will be fixed or preserved in a material that will allow us to do post-flight analysis in some detail. Uh, we'll also be collecting samples of the nutrient solution in which the tumors are growing. Um, this solution allows us to look at potential um, soluble characteristics or soluble factors that could be very important uh, as we analyze them to understand the relationship between these two types of cells and how they function in the human body. Uh, to answer your first question, um, we are not quite sure exactly how much tumor tissue that we will be able to be pro produced on orbit. We anticipate um, that based on the early experimental results that we're getting now, it will be significantly more than we could have even hoped to accomplish in the short term. Um, to give you some sort of a measure of what we normally find in the bioreactor and our ground controls, um, the size of tissue that has uh, aggregated and is being produced so far would have taken approximately a week to accomplish on the ground. That's now been accomplished in less than 24 hours. So we're quite encouraged, as I said. And uh, hopefully this will persist throughout the rest of the uh, uh, mission. And then finally we will harvest material at the end of the mission and we have two ground control reactors as well as the flight reactor, and all of that material will be then returned to the principal investigator. Okay, thanks. And, and I had a wider question for uh, uh, John Charles on, on, the, on the animals, uh, the mice and so forth. How, 
how much have they been uh, checked so far and did they make the launch in uh, good shape? Yeah, the, the rats that are on board were part of, subject to their first health check today and everything is going well with the rats. Okay, let's take questions now from reporters at the Kennedy Space Center. Hi, this is Chris Kreidler from Florida today. Uh, you folks mentioned one or two minor issues, usual expected hiccups. Uh, are, are any of these issues lingering and can you be more specific about what they are or were? Um, let me just speak briefly on uh, one or two minor things on the shuttle and, and, and these are things that are so far down in the noise that we really wouldn't normally mention them. Um, we're carrying a pallet in the back of the vehicle with cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen uh, similar to what we normally carry just under the payload bay liner uh, so that we can fly longer duration. One of two heaters in one of those tanks uh, didn't come on when we did a manual test this morning. We still have a redundant heater in there and for this long emission, we could probably get most of the utility out of that tank just by allowing the cryos to normally boil off over the duration, but it's it's really just a redundancy management question right now. It's not going to affect the flight at all. Um, we have an intercom system to allow the crew to talk between the crew module of the orbiter and the space hab. Again, there are two links there. Uh, one of those links, the ICOM B link, uh, the people in the space hab can hear the shuttle crew calling, but the shuttle crew can't hear uh, the folks in the space hab reply. Again, we have ICOM A that's working just fine. It's not a, a real factor for operations. And uh, we're working with some ground data processing problems. We have a new space hab data link on this flight. Uh, we're getting some data down to the ground through the orbiter KU band system. The KU band system seems to be working fine, but we're having a little bit of a ground processing problem in the control center with just that space hab data, and we're working on troubleshooting that right now. Again, we have workarounds. We can record that data on board and downlink it via a different path, and that data looks fine, so we can get the data by another method as well. All of these are, are really extremely small uh, compared to to the usual kinds of things that we have on flights and I would call this an exceptionally clean orbiter so far. Uh, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, Dr. Charles, could you sort of give a MIDEX update? Uh, how's that working and has it been able to observe any dust storms and indeed are there any dust storms to be observed over the next couple days? Well, uh, I have to start out with a caveat. That's not one of my experiments. That's a separate uh, uh, set of experiments. But what I heard listening to the loop today was that it sounded like it was working well and there, there was one opportunity that didn't have any dust storms visible. So I hope I haven't misspoken too badly. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, y you said the rats look good. Um, have the astronauts been able to observe any of the other animals on board and how are they looking? Well, the rats are the ones that are checked by a visual observation with a health check. The other animals uh, are, are pretty much too small to be looked at directly. And, and on the science payload side, um, you too mentioned a couple hiccups. Uh, could you elaborate? Mostly what, what Phil was mentioning, the, the KU issues are going to have some impact on how we schedule uh, some activities. Some activities require either crew time to, to implement or KU coverage to re remotely command it to observe the, the outcome. And so there's, there's, there's that, that issue of, of trying to, to make sure we have the right, uh, the right access to the, the experiment, either crew time, which is very tight on this mission, or KU coverage, which is, which is also very tight on this mission. And a lot of pre-flight deliberation went into trying to get the right mix. And, and anytime there's even the smallest perturbation to the pre-planned uh, set of activities, then there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, trying to figure out the best way to, re to respond. That's, that's pretty much what I was talking about. Okay, I believe that's all the questions from the Cape. We're back here. Any follow-ups, Mark? Uh, Mark Karof, Neeson Chronicle. I had just a couple follow-up questions. One, uh, since the double space hab is a new configuration module for a laboratory and there's a lot of power demands on this flight, when do you, at what point in the mission do you think you'll have a good handle on your predictions for power usage? Or, or is it a case where you just simply have so much additional power that that's not even a concern for all that's planned? 
Well, let me try to characterize it this way. We launched with about 18 hours of on-orbit margin. We could stay on orbit for 18 hours longer than what we have allocated for the mission. Uh, between yesterday and today, that grew to 22 hours. It's probably a little early in the mission to try to extrapolate that all the way to the end of the flight. So I, I would probably qualify that by saying we'd like to watch that for a couple more days. Um, as you pointed out, this is new and there's a lot of new systems in there. The natural tendency is to estimate somewhat conservatively on the power demands for those systems. We suspect that that may be how we gained the margin yesterday, but it's also difficult with experiments being activated, deactivated, activated again later. You sort of work with average power levels and it's hard to take a snapshot at any one point and say that that's representative. At this point, it looks like we're, we're going to be making a little bit of margin, but I'd wait for a couple of days before I banked on that. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other question had to do with uh, data recording aboard and transmitting to the ground. How much capability do you have to, to record lots of data before you have to dump it to the ground in order to uh, collect your um, experimental information. Do, do you have a, a lot of capability to record it and hold it if you have to or is that a, a or do you have a system where you're always backed up with everything being recorded aboard and then you're dumping it down as you can? I, I'm not clear on just exactly how you manage that. It's a little bit hard to answer that question because in some cases you have to use the same resources to dump the data that you might have been using to get real-time data. If you're not taking the real-time data, that would free up a link for downlink. Typically, even with the shuttle, we record data during short LOS periods and dump that. The recorder on the orbiter has quite a bit more capacity than we ever uh, use, assuming we have the usual distribution of coverage with the TDRS KU downlink time and so on and so forth. I'm afraid I can't really answer explicitly uh, for the payload here how many, say, hours of data they could record before they would dump. And it's a little bit complicated because it depends on how you would trade that off against real-time data. So I can, I can talk to the folks back in the control center and see if we can come up with some kind of a measure for you, but it's a little bit hard to characterize. John, I don't know if you've got any other answer. I, I guess what I just wanted to be sort of clear about was that at this at this point, even with this difficulty you're working, that's not a big deal. You don't feel there's any jeopardy as far as getting data to the experimenters on the ground so that they can work with their experiments in a timely way. I mean, are, is this something you're able to accommodate without jeopardy to your research? My, my understanding is we'd characterize this as an inconvenience, but not a compromise of the science. I also want to point out that, that we haven't given up trying to recover this. We still have some folks in the control center today who are uh, trying to psych out exactly where the problem is, and we're optimistic that we, that we may be able to straighten this out. Okay, that's all the questions. Uh, before we close, a couple of programming notes. We're currently operating on Rev B of the NASA mission television schedule. The video highlights of the last 24 hours of activity on board Columbia will be included in our Flight Day Highlights package, which airs for the first time at 9 p.m. Central Time tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and every hour on the hour as the Red Team continues its sleep period tonight. Our next mission status briefing is on tap for tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. For all the latest news on the STS-107 mission, the Space Shuttle Program, and the International Space Station, please visit our human spaceflight website at spaceflight.nasa.gov. With that, let's go back to mission control and resume mission coverage. Thanks a lot.